YAB Tuan Lim Kuan Ying, the Right Honourable Chief Minister of the United States. YB Jabit Singh, ESCO for Housing and Town and Country Planning. YB Steven Singh, Director Overseeing of Penang Institute and Member of Parliament for Bukit Merataja. Our distinguished panelists, Dr. Lim Kim Hua, Director of Penang Institute, Mr. Chang Kim Loon, Honorable Secretary General of National House Buyers Association, HBA, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon to all of you and welcome to our forum entitled Housing in Malaysia, Issues, Challenges and the Way Forward. My name is Tan Lin and I will be your MC of the day. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank you once again for your presence this afternoon. Without further ado, I would like to invite YB Steven Singh to give his welcoming remarks. Migrant uh, workers' housing in their neighborhood. 
on the in, in the main on the mainland. In other words, the dynamics of housing and development in general revolve around the question: what we want in our backyards, and ultimately who we want as our neighbours. I'm sure the panelists today will give us the economic and uh, political factors affecting the issue of housing. But I want to anticipate and also underline uh, this discussion with this very simply, this simply simple self-reflection. Who is my neighbour? I remember a few years ago, someone I know, an academic no less, told me that we should limit traffic to the island. How? I asked. He said, well, increase the language toll. Impose entry fee into the city, like ERP in Singapore. As a member of parliament serving a constituency on the mainland, and as someone who actually live on the mainland, I was astonished to say the least. Yes, traffic congestion diminishes our quality of life, but alienating half of Penang's population is definitely not the solution. Once again, the question is, who we want, who we want or do not want in our backyards? Which is why I fully support the Penang State Transport Master Plan to improve the links and therefore mobility within the state. But you are forewarned today that this will mean more and more people who are different from us moving around the neighborhood. I personally think that it is a great thing. Plurality is strength of all great cities. And in this age of extremism, it's harder to breed antisocial ideas within a pluralistic neighborhood. And you get that in the Trump election. Mixed neighborhoods are less likely to support extreme nationalism or communalism. Which is why I support the vision of the state government to put up 2,000 units of affordable housing right in the middle of Georgetown, in Jalan S.P. Salaya. This is not new, even for Penang. After all, we were the first state to have public funded social housing scheme. The People's Court, again built right in the middle, in the heart of Georgetown, at Chin Trust Street, by the Georgetown City Council in the, in the 60s. Which is why, unlike other states in Malaysia, the Penang State Government recognizes that development can and should find ways to accommodate what we call Panoroka or city pioneers, often called squatters. The classic case of Kampung Bua Pala and Kampung Tok Subo runs counter actually against uh, the thesis of angles which I cited earlier. The state government ensured that villages are accommodated in the same area with proper and affordable housing once the original slum is cleared to make ways for new development. Which is why I'm also happy that the up and coming township in Banda Kasia in Batu Kawan has a good mix of high end lifestyle activity centers such as IKEA, Design Village, private schools, as well as over 10,000 units of social housing. This, is not only, this not only offers the lower income groups rich opportunities afforded in these areas, but also integrate plurality into our community. All this, my dear friends, involve policy decision on the part of the state government, and at times, these are not very popular because we are, like it or not, jealous guardians of our personal and social space against our neighbour. The visionary influencer of New York City planning, Jane Jacobs herself, wrote about how tolerance and ultimately cooperation in the community is only possible, and I quote her, when streets of great cities have inbuilt equipment allowing strangers to dwell together in peace. That means development policy, housing policy, must consciously make us, or include, making us accommodate our neighbours. But really, back to the question, who is my neighbour? In the story of the Great Samaritan, the answer was obvious. The neighbour is a stranger. Someone from a different race. Someone from a different religion. Someone from a different culture and lifestyle. The toxic others whom we sometimes feel very difficult to live with. What this means has actual policy making impact from the funding of social housing by the government to developmental charges to density concentration to land use. Do we build uh, on hill lands or do we reclaim our shores? 
or we, if we can't touch the shores and the hills, do we build higher, more denser within existing neighborhood, or do we sprawl and build further away from the city, risking more traffic congestions? I want to leave you here with this simple reflection before we go into more systematic uh, and systemic discussion of the issue by our panel of experts. The Penang Institute is, of course, uh, proud to have convened this very experienced panel to speak to us on this very fundamental issue, especially to the hearts of Penangites. For those of us who have been following this issue, I'm sure uh, the panelists will need no introduction. But Penang Institute itself, we have been at the forefront of uh, housing policy research. Our papers, most of it are available on our, on our web page or in our publications, especially the Penang Monthly. They were cited widely by all parties, whether the government or opposition, as well as market players and civil society groups. These latest forums aim to provide members of the public, you, with a platform to discuss current issues and challenges pertaining to the housing uh, sector in Penang and in Malaysia. We also hope to allow more discussion space, brainstorming space, so that we can together formulate ideas to move forward. Finally, I want to thank our Chairman, uh, the Right Honourable Chief Minister of Penang, for making time to join us today. I think his presence here demonstrated to us uh, the importance of housing in the state government's agenda. I wish all of you a fruitful discussion. Thank you very much once again for your presence and your participation. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy Stevenson, for his welcoming remarks. To further proceed, I would like now to invite YAB Lim Kuan Yin, our Right Honourable Chief Minister of Penang, to deliver his opening speech. Thank you. I was Stevenson, the uh, organizer, the director of Penang Institute, and of course, the Member of Parliament for our panel speakers today, led by Yeroa Jadik Simbio, the Penang Exco member for housing, Mr. Chan Kin Lun, the president of the Malaysian House Buyers Association, and um, of course, Dr. Lim Kim Hua, a fellow, as well as uh, a former tutor from Cambridge University in economics. Uh, all the members of the audience gathered today uh, for a very important topic, uh, Housing in Malaysia uh, Forum. Uh, first, uh, let me thank the uh, Institute for putting together uh, this important topic, uh, very pertinent when you talk about exercising uh, government powers in order to ensure housing democracy. Uh, to what extent these powers are exercised whether for the benefit of the public or for the benefit of the developers. In Penang, the state government places a high emphasis on housing. Uh, in my 2014 budget speech, I mentioned the state government's aim to achieve a, democratic, a democratization of housing in order to fulfill Penang's aspiration to have their own hope or a roof over their heads, especially from the low-income groups. Being a land scarce a state, we face our own challenges when you talk about building houses. And uh, in a way, sometimes you are a victim of our own success. Uh, because uh, Penang has the only industrialized state in Malaysia, we have seen uh, a growth which is above or exceeds the GDP growth of the national of the whole country. Uh, and with manufacturing uh, investments still flowing in, together with a very strong growth of tourism, uh, land prices, of course, has escalated, and uh, traffic congestion has also ensued, following the influx not just of investors but also of tourists. Um, and we know that this problem uh, will not go away. 
as the name becomes more attractive, sure, uh, there will be greater demand for land. Uh, after all, if you look at uh, CNN, CNN recently set out 17 of the best places to visit in the world. And of the 17 of the best places to visit in the world, we then came out number two, which I think is something that no one expected. Uh, and for us to be right at the top, world class there, I think that shows uh, uh, that we have slowly emerged uh, from the doldrums to be on the global map. And uh, the first three months of the year, the growth in number of passengers coming through the Penang International Airport has been quite surprising. Uh, we did around 1.57 million passengers for the first three months of last year. This year we did 1.98 million passengers, a growth of 26%. Now if you talk about 6 to 7 percent growth, you know that that is considered quite good. But 26% is completely beyond expectations. But that only indicates that Penang continues to attract not just investors but also tourists and of course uh, other relations who think of coming here. Now our focus when we talk about housing would not be those uh, housing where prices are decided by developers or based on the scenario of maximizing their profits. Our focus when we talk about housing will be focused on public housing, which means basically low cost and low middle cost housing, as well as affordable housing, where the price uh, is set in uh, on Penang Island at 300,000 ringgit and on the mainland at 200,000 ringgit. Uh, previously, it was 400,000 and 250,000, but we have reduced price of affordable housing, which was actually set by the federal government, we have reduced it to 300,000 on the island and 200,000 on the mainland. And of course, this has caused some disparity between federal and state policy, uh, as far as housing is concerned. And the federal government has naturally uh, used their powers to exercise punitive action when necessary against uh, the state government. Under the previous minister, uh, many housing developers in Penang were denied their applications for APDF as advertising permit and development license. And this of course contributed not just to delays, but of course increase in costs, which will be unfortunately later passed on to buyers. Now fully aware of uh, these challenges, as well as our own limitations. Uh, we decided to provide for affordable housing. The federal government is supposed to build affordable housing, whether prima or PPRD, but sadly that is lacking. Uh, while we will probably go in detail afterwards how lacking that is. That as far as uh, housing is concerned, we are not only marginalized, but we are completely ignored. And I think this is why we have decided that we have probably to try to jumpstart the affordable housing market by set, setting up an affordable housing fund to the tune of half a billion million, 500 million million. Of course, this is not just a building by the state government, but also in partnership with the private sector. Between 2008 and 2016, uh, the state government has built 20,887 units of affordable housing of all categories throughout Penang. I think this is probably something that uh, many do not realize. We are in the process of completing 20,887 units of affordable housing. Now this is over uh, eight year period. Now, over the previous seven years before 2008, under Barisan National, they only built 5,124 units. In other words, we are four, more than four times better 
than the previous government. Our problem, of course, is load approvals by commercial banks. So we can build, and we have built, but if they cannot be sold, then they are stuck. Because we need the sales, the revenue from the sales to not just renew but to uh, use it for uh, further construction of other affordable housing units. But this is not just a state problem, this is a national problem. National problem in the sense that uh, there are many applicants for affordable housing or even for public housing, but because of the strict guidelines imposed by Bank Nagara, many applicants cannot get loans. Uh, even a low cost housing at 42,000 ringgit, they cannot get loans. I think we, our desperation, the state government even reduced it by 20%. But still, they could not get loans. I mean, instead of 42,000, we sold it, I think. Uh, for around 33, 34,000. But many still couldn't get the loans required, even though we, we pushed down the prices. And that shows how strict and how severe the housing guidelines, housing planning guidelines are now. Uh, we estimated that there are roughly 70% of applicants who are rejected for housing loans. And that's why. Penang, believe it or not, we have many empty affordable housing units. We also have empty low cost and low middle cost house, low middle cost houses or flats available for sale. Even Penang. Principally because the applicants are not qualified for housing loans. Um, it's sometimes something that I really cannot understand. Why is it that we have, we have imposed such strict guidelines when a person wants to buy his first home, his first home, which is a low-cost house, where I think the price of low-cost house will be even, uh, the actual construction cost of low-cost house is probably nearly three times the price of the house, and there should be no problem selling the house. But yet, such strict guidelines are imposed. Okay, at the same time, you see people able to get hundreds of millions of ringgit of loans without any problem, even though they do not have any security that justify them lending hundreds of millions of ringgit. I'm sure you can think of several characters or several individuals in mind. Buy your own house, a local house, 42,000, so difficult. But getting a loan to buy power assets, huh? to purchase some paintings here and there over the world. No problem. Billions of ringgit all over the place. So there is a terrible uh, disconnect. Not just a mismatch, it's worse than a mismatch. This is a, a dysfunctional uh, banking system. And uh, there needs to be a complete overhaul. Otherwise, we will have to stop building affordable homes. We will have to stop building public housing because we just cannot afford to leave it empty. Since we did not want to leave some of our public housing empty, we decided to uh, rent it out under a savourably uh, uh, a rent uh, and uh, sell system. But that is not viable. That is not viable because we don't have the funds to build houses for rental. Uh, Bearing in mind, uh, state government's uh, resources are quite limited. Even if you double the 500 million, it's still not enough. <clears throat> Just building a low cost uh, flat comprising of a few hundred units, you could probably cost you 150 million. So you just cannot afford to build public housing for rental. And it's critical that Bank Nagara plays its role. There should be Equality. Everybody should be treated equally. There should not be double standards. And I think they have a social responsibility to help poor first time buyers. So,
So this is, I think, uh, uh, the challenge that we face, especially for affordable housing and, of course, uh, public housing. Uh, but despite that, I think we have uh, we are still continuing our efforts to build more affordable housing units as well as, as public housing. Uh, we understand that uh, the uh, economic climate appears positive for investors despite the economic downturn. But I think Penang has managed to weather the economic downturn better than uh, other states. Uh, there are still sales of houses, unlike some states where there are zero sales, not low sales, there are zero sales. We still have some sales. And when the economy picks up, I'm sure uh, this will be much, I mean, we will recover much quicker yeah, in Penang. So, of course, back again to affordable housing, number one, the problem of housing loans. Number two, the problem of speculation. Because of the, uh, the huge spike in prices of property, there are some who buy houses and then after that, they will dispose of for a tiny profit. Now, we have taken several cooling measures, several cooling measures to uh, prevent Smash speculation. Otherwise, we have a housing bubble in Penang. In a way, we are fortunate that we have managed to uh, slowly uh, tamp down the housing bubble. I think the cooling measures help. Uh, some of the cooling measures include, of course, uh, limiting the purchases by foreigners of uh, properties for landed property in Penang. You must see above 3 million. For apartment or a condominium, it must be above a million. And on the mainland, it is uh, one million uh, for landed property and uh, five hundred thousand ringgit for an apartment. There is also a levy imposed, a three percent, three uh, percent fee imposed on property purchased by foreigners, as well as a moratorium on sub-sale of affordable units for a period for five years and uh, for low cost and low medium cost and years. So that, I think, help to ensure that there is no property bubble or uh, speculation. And for those who flip property within that period, especially for uh, affordable housing, we also impose a 2% levy. So this is to ensure that genuine buyers are in the market and of course to avoid unnecessary property speculation. So that is the second problem I think we should have addressed. So I think the cooling measures help. Uh, the third of course is uh, social responsibility and uh, that we have also uh, tried to encourage uh, housing developers uh, to build low-cost homes and low-medium-cost homes by imposing a very high penalty in lieu of building public housing. For low-cost house or low-cost or low-medium-cost houses in uh, on the island, they would have to pay 120000 for local developers. For those developers outside Penang, they have to pay 150000 ringgit per unit. And that will have to be paid to the state. So of course we are reviewing, reviewing these guidelines to see whether there's a need to further increase the amount of contribution. I think that will be decided by the end of the year. One matter which I think I would like to touch upon, uh, especially uh, in light of the controversy over the VHL uh, construction case in KL is the use of ministerial powers whether by the officer or by the minister to grant extension of time to housing developers. Now, I think under the Housing Developers Act, you are required or the developer is required to construct or finish completing a house within a period of two years. For a 
flat, they have to finish and uh, deliver the property within three years. Extension of time can be granted either by the Ministry of Housing Officer under Section 11.3 or by the Minister under Regulation 12. And according to uh, the statistics given uh, by uh, Mr. Chan Kim Dung just now as well, uh, figures obtained from the website uh, for the year between 2014 and up to February 2017, the officer granted 291 extensions. And that is only for a three year period. So that means uh, you get your house later and you cannot claim repeated damages for late delivery. The developer need not pay you compensation. The minister has given 19 approvals, oh sorry, 13 approvals over this similar three year period. And one cannot question the reasons for granting that extension. Now, I, of course, understand that for certain projects, you may need an extension. Actually, for high-rise projects, those which are both 30 stories, it is quite difficult to finish it or to, to deliver it within three years. Most uh, developers will say they will need probably three and a half to four years. But be that as it may, such powers should only be exercised before the sales and purchase agreement is signed. We don't have any figures here whether the extension of time was granted before the sales and purchase agreement was signed or after it was signed with the purchases. So my own opinion is this. If the minister is exercise his powers or the Ministry of Housing official is exercise his powers, it can only be exercised before the sales and purchase agreement is signed with the purchases. When the sales and purchase agreement is signed, you cannot do so unless you get the consent of the purchases. Because it will not be fair otherwise. You are supposed to get a house within three years, suddenly the minister extends it to by one more year to four years. And he is not a party to the contract. He doesn't consult you, he just extends. No reason given. That type of power is open to abuse. Why should the developer be given that benefit? So far, we have not got any information. How many was granted before the sales and purchase agreement was signed? How many was granted? How many extensions were granted after the sales and purchase agreement was signed? So we are still awaiting information from the minister concerned. But of course, the court has struck down the extension of time granted by the minister, and of course, he's appealing. But that shows that this exercise of administrative power is illegal. And rightly so, illegal. Because purchases are not consulted. Uh, Mr. Chang will probably have more information, not just on VHL construction, uh, the very uh, famous uh, court case now. Uh, subject to appeal at the Court of Appeal, as well as other matters related to uh, ministerial powers uh, able uh, at his discretion to run extension of time. But I think this is a very important issue because it involves money, money that is due to the purchasers, and of course, huge amount of money that can be saved by the developer. So I think these are some of the issues that I'm sure will be addressed. And as I said again, I'll just like to summarize by emphasizing that the biggest problem now is still Bank Negara. As strong as Bank Negara does not loosen the lending guidelines for first-time buyers of public and affordable housing, our property market will continue to be in the slump. Those which are above 300,000, I think they can take care of themselves. But we are looking at affordable housing below 300,000. First time buyers, those uh, young professionals who are just starting up, 
building up a family or building up their business, I think Bank Negara should give some allowance and look after them. Unless they do so, whatever upturn in the property market will not matter for a majority of the public, a majority of house purchases. The uh, personal household debt is said to be a big problem that the federal government wants to address. Uh, you're looking at what 89% now is reduced to 86%. But if you look at that figures, you break it down. How many percent does it cover first-time house buyers? How many percent does it cover first-time house buyers? And that's why I think there should be an emphasis to assist this group. Even if uh, you have to spend some money in the process, it is still worth it. You know, lately the Prime Minister launched a program where they pay 10%, 10% of the deposit for the house. Many purchasers and applicants still can't get a loan, even though 10% was paid by the federal government. And we tried, we offered 20% discount, and still they couldn't get a loan. So this shows how serious the problem is. And that uh, because of the low incomes prevalent, that many just cannot fulfill the guidelines, the lending guidelines required to secure a loan. Now, of course, we are not uh, encouraging the reckless lending, no. But when you are just starting out in the world, and you are buying your first house, having your first baby, I think it's natural. Uh, there has been uh, discussions that we talk about uh, loans, that it should be progressive. Progressive in the sense that the initial payments, monthly uh, housing installments should be lower. And then it becomes bigger as the years go by because your income naturally increases later. So we do not see why uh, the federal government cannot tailor uh, these uh, any guidelines to suit and of course to assist the first time house buyers. Now we believe that uh, such a uh, housing democratic approach, uh, uh, we talk about housing democracy, a uh, housing democratic approach is possible. And I don't think the cost uh, is un unsustainable. Unsustainable. I think we can uh, afford it, uh, provided, of course, that we get our act together on other matters. So sometimes I just can understand why look look at uh, seven billion or twenty two billion here gone billions of bring it there gone but then you quibble over tens or hundreds of billions of ringgit but billions of ringgit it doesn't matter tens or hundreds of billions of ringgit you make a big you a cry a typical penny wise pound foolish approach and at this is what we must change if you are given the opportunity in in Putrajaya. Rest assured, people like Chang Kim Lun, people like us, will strike terror in the hearts of housing developers and bank the Kano officials. <laughs> and this is what I'm sure we'll discuss afterwards to see how we can manage that better. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chief Minister, for his enlightening speech. Now I would like to invite our moderator of the day, Ms. Ong Selwyn, the Senior Executive Officer of Penang Institute, up to the stage. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lee Ying. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, so first of all, this uh, forum will start with a presentation by Mr. Chang. Then later, it will have a panel discussion by both uh, Wendy Jack Tate uh, and Dr. Lim Kim Hwang joining Mr. Chang on stage. So um, today, we will be preparing for uh, Mr. Chang. A little introduction about Mr. Chang. He is actually the founder and the honorary 
Secretary General of the National Housing Buyers House Buyer Association. I'm sorry. So he is a legal practitioner as well as a counselor for MP Subang Jaya. So uh, together, please welcome Mr. Chang to deliver his uh, topic on understanding what house buyer really wants. Chief Minister of Penang, and Boromat Jagdeep Singh, ex of Housing, Town and Country Planning, Yang Boromat Stephen Lim, Director of Penang Institute, and MP of uh, Bukit Mataja, Distinguished Panelist, Dr. Lim, Director of Penang Institute, Distinguished Guest, Madam Moderator, Learned Audience, the Academician, the uh, Conference Organizers, Ladies and Gentlemen. Selamat sejahtera. Thank you for inviting HBA to be here. It is indeed an honor to be invited to be a speaker in this session. Understand what first time buyer really want. Now, the National House Buyers Association, in short, we call ourselves HBA, is a voluntary, non profit, non political organization met by volunteer members of various professions. We operate purely on the volunteers' workers' benevolence. All of our office bearers are all volunteers, and we pull our resources together and uh, strive for the rights of house buyers against RADA. RADA is the organization of developers. Why shouldn't house buyers be organized ourselves? That is why we started the National House Buyers Association as against RADA. Now the aim is to balance out the disadvantaged position of house buyers in the housing supply dominated market and uh, not continue to hold on to the short end of the stick. We strive for a balanced, fair, equitable treatment for house buyers in their dealing with housing developers. Our, our purpose is also to create awareness of legal rights and to voice house buyers' interests and concern in the housing arena. For more information of our aims and objective, please uh, visit our website at www.hba.org.my. Sorry for the interruption. Now, in this August assembly of people who are experts in their own field and profession, HBA humbly seek your patience to expound our views on the state of affairs in the housing industry. But whatever they are worth, they represent our views, which we believe is representative of the thousands of house buyers past, present and future who find buying and hunting for a house to call it their home a nightmarish dream. Ladies and gentlemen, I will take you to several of our topics. I will talk about Budget 2014, the effective cooling measures, HBA's additional proposal, Affordable Housing Part 1, how to own it, housing, uh, affordable housing, compliance costs, driving prices up, Protection, who protects house buyers? Who protects purchaser? Cycle of complaints, new doesn't mean perfect. Worst of which are abandonment. Balancing risk between buying and renting. Educating of a, and protecting first time buyers. Enforcement of the law. And meeting the needs and expectation of house buyers that the bill and sell 1090 concept. Now uh, I believe the organizers have given me 20 minutes. <coughs> But she is not armed with any bell whatsoever, therefore I shall continue <laughs> until I finished. Now, um, I always cry this, Harga rumah melampau. That is a desperate cry of our rakyat against our skyrocketing house prices, who has, for the last six years, we have told the government, the federal government, that house prices have become very really ridiculous. The National House Buyers Association has consistently called on the federal government intervention to prevent a homeless generation of young adults from emerging, especially in the urban and suburban areas, who is not for the wild speculation would have been able to buy properties. Now, this matter is of grave urgency because the homeless hail from the lower middle class, first time house buyers, usually graduates couple, or the self-employed earning reasonable income and expecting to buy a house to commence their family life in a fixed effort. The, in, 
The government strive to home ownership. Low stamp duty has been uh, imposed to encourage first-time buyers to own a home. But speculators have taken advantage of it by accumulating multiple units. There are three types of purchasers in the market, namely necessity. Necessity, those who buy out of need, sub-occupation. Proportionary, those who buy to hedge against inflation and for long-term investment. The culprit of which are the speculators, those who buy to flip and make money against everyone's interest except their own. But the cooling measures came into place. The federal government heeded our call to say that Budget 2014, we will reinforce and bring back rail property gain tax. That was good for us. This rail property gain tax, RPGT, was formerly known as Anti-Property Speculation Act. Then we have the tightening of a loan to value ratio. And finally, we banned DIBS. DIBS with developer interest bearing scheme. We now see that the property prices is slowing down to a certain extent, but not good enough. To me, budget 2014 is best described as a good formula to curb the unbridled escalation of house prices which has for the last five years escalated and skyrocketed. These are some of those articles that we have penned. I've got a column in the Star Business page. Feel free to key in my name as well as those articles we have just popped up. Budget 2014. House prices in Malaysia are unaffordable. Rising property prices. Paper gain means nothing. Affordable housing, the buzzword. Increased transparency in prices. And come budget 2017. We made additional proposal uh, in uh, September 2016. And it was announced in budget 2017, October, that we shall now increase stamp duties. The stamp duties will be increased for, uh, for uh, effective next year. We have also told the government to outlaw investors' clubs. There have been a lot of speculation through investors' clubs. Buy with no money. And all these property gurus make a lot of promises how to become a millionaire overnight. Without money whatsoever, you can become a millionaire. Now, these are the investors' clubs that we got to outlaw. So we have told government that this tantamounts to insider trading, as in the stock market. Similarly, this stock speculators are now coming into the property market to speculate. This definitely had to be our law. Of speculators and bogus houses, we now got bogus house buyers because these speculators, we call them flippers as well as bogus house buyers. They are not real house buyers. They buy and flip to the detriment of genuine house buyers. Now, but we have got the Housing Developers Act. Housing Development Act, Control Licensing Act and its regulation, the recital speaks very clearly. An act to provide for the control and licensing of business of housing development in Peninsula, Malaysia for the protection and interest of purchaser and for matters connecting uh, thereafter. But why do we find cycle of complaints? Why is it that there are so many complaints? Some of those complaints are as follows. Men of delivery or vacant possession not complied with. Defects in properties not rectified promptly. Offering to compromise on LAD and in some cases refusing, neglecting. Failure to pay LD, LAD. And this is now compounded by the fact that the minister is granting EOT. This has surprised us a lot. When the, our group of this case, that is a controversial case, was brought up by our group of lawyers, we fought this case against the developer BHL on a pro bono basis. Pro, pro bono means free of charge, you know. And then when the minister, when the minister as our first defendant, second defendant being a controller housing, they lost the case over to us at the High Court Appellate Section. So when, uh, why? Yeah, Ahmad Borma, Lim Guan Eng asked the uh, minister to stop appealing whatsoever because let the decision be done. I disagree. Because I have provoked the minister to appeal further. It is because like this. If the High Court has made a decision, 
the other high court need not have to follow. So therefore, I need to fight it higher. So when we told the ADC Chairman, why don't you fight us further? Let's take it to court appeal. If whoever loses, we take it to federal court. Because why? We want to set a precedent so that that precedent cannot be rattled. That is very important. That's why our group of lawyers has agreed to go ahead, pro bono all the way to federal court. That's all. This is a cycle of complaints. Some of those pictures they were taken, and these are real pictures. New doesn't mean perfect. The fact that you buy a new house doesn't mean that it's perfect. Poor workmanship, substandard materials. These are water ponding, and these are real stuff. That's the tanky above that cracking. The beams too are giving way. The non-application of strata title has been a very crucial item down here. A lot of developers don't apply for strata because having collected a full purchase price, they don't apply. So what do we do? Again, the government heeded our call. We wanted the law to be changed in such a way that vacant possession must come with strata. That law has been changed, effective June 2015. All new house buyers after the date, June 15, June 2, uh, 1st June 2015, will enjoy the benefit of having an SP agreement, that's Schedule H, whereby vacant possession can only be delivered to the house buyers with electricity and water and the ownership paper. That's the strata title. So here we close the floodgate of developer not applying because we make them apply during the course of construction, so long they have got a G12, the main firm has been done, it can be surveyed for strata purposes. The worst of which are abandoned projects. The government, federal government, has got the statistics of abandoned projects. But the statistics are very high. You do not know the statistics at all. But we belong to a special committee that looked into a better project, checked by uh, Tan Sri uh, Muhammad uh, Sidek last time. We got the statistics. But somehow, they played down the statistics. Obviously, for, uh, for reasons uh, why they played it down. They cut the uh, statistics into three sections. One, Project Lewat, Project Saket, Baru Lata Pongkalai. No, instead of all being turbung kalai, problematic to me, all these three categories are problematic. They already got problems. They are late because the completion date is supposed to be 24 months, then exceeded 24 months. Suck it, some of it suck it for 16 years. Can you fancy that? <laughs> I've got no statistics. If it's 16 years, it should be in coma. We might as well have another category called coma. Statistics on no project coma. Right. Now, the statistics of abandoned project must be declared by the minister. You have got Lewat Sake. Before it can mature into Terpengkalai, the minister must declare. For so long he don't declare, sorry, he's still in the Sake stage. <laughs> so, but why does he not want to declare? Obviously for KPI reasons. That's the reason. That is why we have spoken to the current minister of housing, that's a Tan Sri No Oma. Nothing to hide. These cases under Sakit Lewat is going to haunt you. You might as well declare them as abandoned. Then the sooner you declare them abandoned, the sooner rescue plans can be launched. Otherwise, how will you launch it? If it's for 16 years abandoned, you can't salvage a date. Good. That's about it. <coughs> but then again, now, smokers in the you know smokers in the secret box we've got this Amara and Poli Karajan Malaysia. Morocco, one bahayakan kesihatan. But why isn't there any amaran for house buyers that there is a possibility, yeah? whatever project you have got, ada, kadang-kadang ada situasi di mana project boleh terpenggalai. Why don't we ask the minister to chop it on the, on the S&P agreement? Project ni mungkin terpenggalai. Kita tak tahu buat macam mana. At least there's a warning to the house buyers that, hey, we do not guarantee completion, you know, uh, there's this risk. But there was no notification for house buyers. So that's very unfair over to us. But what's the consequence of abandonment? House buyer has to uh, continue to service bank interest. House buyers have to rent house. 
financial difficulty, emotional nightmare, meaning you've got a quarrel with your wife every day. The wife said, you bodoh sekali, mengapa you beli projek terbengkalai? Eh, but the poor husband didn't want to buy a project terbengkalai. He does not know he's going to be terbengkalai. He just bought it because the wife liked it, and to shelter the family, that's a very noble cause. But sometimes they get heated arguments. Because you've got your majority part of installments has gone into servicing a bank loan and you don't have a house. That's what really happens down on the ground. Legal complication, of course, if you do not service your bank loan, foreclosure, the banks are going to foreclose on the property. This, uh, this photographs are collected by our volunteers. We take time to go take pictures and show it over to you. We have got it in Rawang, Bukit Beruntung, tapi dia tak. We have got a lot of projects, Lumba Beringin, abandoned for 12 years. Can you fancy that? Uh, but then Penang itu ada projek yang mengalai. I brought along the statistics to show you. Uh, projek sakit lewat pun ada. Tapi saya tujuh kan? I'm a counselor with MPSJ. Uh, when I assumed the job as a counsellor in 2001, uh, 2008, when Pakatan government came into place, there were 18, 19 abandoned projects in MPHJ. I'm pleased to report that in MPHJ, there's only one left. Because what do you do? We preempt these kind of issues. We make sure that developer come over and report on whoever right now coming. We have a fast track approval for them to make sure that there's no more abandoned project. We preempt abandoned projects nowadays. What we do is, we have our officers visit sites. If it's Saket Lewat, bring up, hold in the developer and talk to them. Because it's within our skyline that we do not want abandoned projects. Of course, federal government got its own power. The local council too has their own power. And this is a very appropriate picture of a lady in frustration. <laughs> <laughs> Not racist, but that uh, you know, this was the most uh, appropriate picture for us. That's why we, uh, we brought it up from the uh, internet. Abandoned homes, abandoned dreams, addressing abandoned issues. Now, uh, the next item I'll talk about uh, is a balancing risk between buying and renting. Uh, buying and owning a home is a riskier proposition for households comparing to renting. Buyers take on enormous loans, sign multiple loan agreements, and become responsible as homeowners cost for their homes. Foreclosure is very important. You must understand if you fail to pay installments for the house, foreclosure can devastate a family, economic, and social standing and make you house buyer poor. So to us here in HBA, unless you can afford to buy a home, don't force yourself to buy. Renting is a much easier uh, proposition. Don't get yourself stuck in a project for 30 years and slave for the bank for 30 years. At the end of the day, low pay hit. Chinese say, blood comes out from the nostril. You tablet the hand. Therefore, please, don't force yourself to buy. When the federal government says that, okay, we will pay deposit for you to buy a house. You actually pampering him to buy a house. You must not give him a 10% loan to buy a house. The more you borrow, the more you pay. Do, do, do they not realize that area? The more you borrow, the more you pay. So if you're going to slave for a bank for the next 30 years, your standard of living is going to be affected. Your grandfather's medical bills are not going to be paid. Your lifestyle of going overseas are not going to be enjoyed at all. So because of a multiple layer loan that you're stuck with, the standard goes down. You have a lot less social obligation. You, you don't have that anymore. You've got no life at all already, you know. Understand? So to me, renting is easier. You don't like that place, you pack your bag and shift off to the next one. You rent into a premises, the landlord is arrogant. The premises is dilapidated. I move away, I take my bag, I move on to the next premises. Isn't that easier? If I get relocated over to Penang to work, I pack my bag and go to Penang. Why should I be stuck with a property in KL? It's easier. But educating house buyers is equally important. 
We always say, you know, buying a house is, a, is the largest and most complicated financial commitment where most people ever make. But potential buyers must understand there are a lot of barriers. It's our obligation if you buy a house to make sure that we promptly pay a loan, repay the loan. It's also our obligation to make sure that legal fees and duties for loan as well as S&P agreement are also paid. It's also our obligation to pay for credit rent, assessment, maintenance, charge, and sinking fund. If you are staying in strata title, if this basic thing you do not know, uh, might as well don't buy. Do you realize that buying a property, landed property, is much easier than buying a strata property? When you buy a landed property, all you need to le learn is sale and purchase agreement, title deed, LAD. That's about it. But when you buy a strata property, you got to know about S and P. LAD, Strata Management Act, Strata Management Regulation, GMB, MC, COB. There's so much things you need to learn when it comes to Strata. But we have written 15 articles on Strata so the house buyers can read and understand it. Serve our website, some of the articles are there. If not, you just key National House Buyers Association or under my name, Chang Kim Lo. Then you'll find those articles there. But we are frustrated because there's no single umbrella to coordinate distribution of availability. Now, government may have a lot of uh, properties for sale. Yes, we have got those properties on that. But I believe Penang has done it very well. You have got a system whereby where are the units are going to be built. It's all, I, I checked your website. It, the, the availability is there. But there must have three categories. Those available immediately, those under construction, and those under planning. Those details must be available, so assuming that I want to ship over to Paya the Tamporo. I I have to just key in and it tells me how many units are available. That, that's much easier. But have we have done articles here, helping the poor owned houses. Here we tell the public, the rich people, they got lawyers, we don't have to worry about them. Right? It's just the poor and the marginal society and people, they don't understand English. They don't, are not very well educated. Therefore, it's responsible government to come up with a hope ownership program. What you must know pre-purchase education program and post-purchase education program. That is very important. Understand the process of buying a house, evaluating household requirements, understanding the house buyer's pack that you're buying, understanding a loan process, or post purchase, understanding your rights to pay quit rent assessment. The necessity that you must pay quit rent assessment because if you do not pay, then you have failed as a defaulter. And social applications, house maintenance too. We have got all the laws in town, but sad to say, our enforcement is bad. Had the enforcement be good, you think because so many abandoned projects. <laughs> the two uh, last year in Parliament, the Deputy Minister of Housing proudly announced we have got only 30 abandoned projects last year. To me, one abandoned project is far too many, and 30 abandoned projects and you're bloody proud about it. <laughs> it doesn't make sense, you know. 30 abandoned projects, and he announced in Parliament, we are pleased to announce 30. One is bad enough, can you fancy them? So we, we wrote an article over to him. Let's study the law. Nah. We have a preemptive measure. Why didn't you preempt abandonment? We've got section 7F. All developers must quarterly file in their status of construction. That's 7, more on 7F. Nah. How many have you sold? What are the units you have sold? Stage of development, progress payment, all that. So if you have got a person qualified to look at more on 7F, you're okay. But you find a kaka, you sit down there, you file in, you file in the file. What is there to diagnose? Nothing to diagnose. So what you need is a person who's qualified to look into the Boron 7 app, understand what's the symptoms, whether it's going to fall sick or not. Then you understand better. You need an engineer, you need a lawyer, you need an architect to understand these stuff. You cannot have a kaka who take the form, thank you for filing within time, and here goes into the file. You need to diagnose it, you know. You need to diagnose it. Otherwise, how do you account for all the abandoned project? We have got fantastic laws, I tell you. Because section 10, section 11, minister's power to take over abandoned project. Has he invoked the power? None. 
We are challenging in court later. <laughs> but meeting the needs of house buyers' expectation. At the end of the day, we have been fighting this bill and sell 1019. We nearly won, you know, bill and sell 1019. Our law was changed. We not only do we have schedule G and H, we now have schedule I and J. I and J under housing developers regulation means build and sell 1090 for Terrace House. Uh, schedule J is bill and sell for strata property. The law was changed in 2012. But however, this current minister, brother, the Abdul Rahman Dahlan, he made a U-turn. Previous minister Cho Chi Hong, Tan Sri Paduka Cho Chi Hong, agreed in parliament that build and sell shall be made mandatory come 2015, year 2015. It was recorded in parliament handset. Bukan cadangan. Ni secara mandatory, registered in parliament, is going to be made mandatory come 2015. But when the when the new minister came in at the time, uh, Abdul Rahman came in, he said, Ni baru cadangan saja. I said, no, there's a difference between cadangan and secara mandatory. You read the parliament. So I had to cut and paste and give in the parliamentary sections on that, uh, parliament handset, as well as advertise a newspaper. The Sun newspaper was good. They allowed me one whole page to argue that issue, cut and paste from parliament uh, you know, handset. You know. But the minister was not rattled. He refused to go ahead with the bill himself, and a lot of public consumer association accused him of making a U-turn. Jadi tak ditapati. It was not fulfilled at all. So now we are back to square one. We don't have bill and sell 1090. But the good goodness is that, see, we want the bill and sell 1090 to protect the public. You only pay 10% down, no more payment until the house is completed. It, it basically means that your money is still with you, you only lock in 10%. When the house is completed with title, with ownership papers, free of defects, then only it makes sense for us to buy. It becomes meaningful to collect the key. Otherwise, it's meaningless to buy a house and then take the developer to try, you know. All house buyers got no, we got no stamina you know, to fight the developer in court. We don't have the zest to want to take a developer to try you know, to fight. What we want is just to buy a house only one. What's so difficult about it? So don't give me a rotten house. Just give me the house that I bargained for. Was that so difficult? That's why the bill itself, 1090, was mooted by us and insisted the government changed it. But we are not giving up the fight yet. <clears throat> we have managed to convince a lot of big developers to do bill and 1090, one of which was SP Satya. They have embarked on $7 billion worth of bill and 1090 in the Klang Valley. <clears throat> but our duty was not to protect the rich people to buy a million dollar property in the Klang Valley. Our duty was to protect the poor fellow who didn't understand English. That was the point really. But nonetheless, Bill and 1090 has picked up. Okay? Whether it's a developer's marketing ploy or whatsoever, but at least it has picked up. Lah. Okay? Now, uh, in conclusion, true pros of comprehensive uh, approach to compliance with law and regulation, education, enforcement, legislation. Our recommendation. Note to house buyers, buying a house is a very serious investment that must work right on the first try and no mistakes. Do not be impulsive. Patience and planning are the key word. Buy completed property. What you see is what you get. Don't buy a pie in the sky. Thank you very much. <laughs> Now, let's move straight on to the panel discussion. The number one question to home ownership, as everyone here is concerned, somehow drills down to the qualifying for a mortgage loan. So, maybe to start off from an economic point of view, Dr. Lim, what is your opinion about the current financial model of the country? Thank you, uh, I guess uh, the level of financing is, an issue, is a key element of any property purchase. In Malaysia, it seems that we are adopting a, a hybrid system whereby there is not much differentiation between mortgage uh, financing mode used to finance a self-occupied self property versus a mortgage that is being used to finance 
um, progress or investment purpose. What I mean by that is if you look at uh, other countries, say for example in the UK, if you buy a property for self-use, you will be assessed slightly differently from a property that you, you bought to rent out for investment purpose. So for, for property used for investment purpose, it's judged mainly in terms of the level of yield, the rental yield, and the interest that you'll be paying versus the amount of free cash flow that you would have and the amount of interest cover and repayment that you will be able to, to judge. Whereas in Malaysia, it seems that the focus is much more in terms of the loan to value amount and the amount of value of loans and properties that you already have on the book versus the amount of income of these things and what are the types of assets that you have to uh, serve as collateral towards the property. So when there is interest when, when both are not exactly the same, it then brings on the issue of how do we actually separate out the two different types of objectives of how to purchase. Like what Mr. Chang has highlighted, a purchase of a house could be for your own self-use, consumption purposes, or could be for investment purposes, whether it's speculative or whether it's for invest, uh, inflation hedge or for other reasons. So for these other types, how would a good financing model be applicable? The, the issue of housing and affordability of housing is not unique to Malaysia, it's not unique to Penang. If you look at London, Vancouver, Australia, Hong Kong, Singapore, all these countries or all these places globally has this issue, has this problem of affordability. And nothing much can be can be said in the terms of it is not, it, yes, it is a, it's a global issue, it's also a local issue. What I mean by that is that if you look at certain countries, say for example in Singapore, there is a very strict anti-speculative policy which has resulted in property prices literally falling in Singapore. So property prices are falling in Singapore and look at what, what the property prices in Hong Kong that has gone up and up and up despite the local government imposing levies. So it is a very difficult balance that one has to strike in terms of imposing the right level of policies, levies and penalties or taxation to control speculative activities while allowing the market to perform its uh, signaling price mechanism, price finding role. So, uh, financing model is, a, is an issue, but it's also not as simple as just being a, a policy that can be reversed easily. Thank you, Dr. Lin. So, um, maybe Mr. Chang, would you like to add a little bit more about the um, mortgage loan? How difficult actually it has become for owners today? Now, we all know banks and financial institutions, or DFI, development in, uh, 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 Financial Development Bank, they are prudent and they are responsible in approving financing for those eligible, those li eligible, all right? Why I say that is that, do you not know that when the banks reject a certain loan, they are doing you a favor, you know? You know why? You're not eligible. So why crack your head what to buy when you're not eligible at all? Now, assuming. He, you, you, you want to take a loan of $500,000, but you pay, you got no income tax form, you know. You're a fishmonger, you know. <laughs> you may have a lot of fixed deposits, but so what? All banks must work on documentary. Documents. You've got to show proof that you have got it. Assuming you got FD, fair enough. Bank will then maybe allow a loan over to you based on the collateral of the house as well as the pledge of FD. This can be done. You got to review this stuff all that. So to me, when a bank rejects a loan, he is telling you you're not eligible. Therefore, you do not warrant that kind of loan that you're asking for. That's five hundred thousand dollars. But however, should you ask for a lower loan? Yes, you are then eligible. It, it all boils down to what is your eligibility. Okay. Now, of course, we have come up with newspapers to support radar. We told radar says there are a lot of properties. They have got but cannot sell because a lot of loans have been rejected. 70% loans have been rejected. But knowing radar, they always exaggerate. Lah. They always radar is our opponent, I'm just to let you know. It's Real Estate Housing Developers Association. They are our rich cousins. You understand? Yeah. 
We are the rich one, we are the fuller who fight for the poor fuller. That's a problem around there. So we are for the house buyer. All of us are house buyers. I even tell developers, hey, you may be a developer now, you know. Your son now may be a house buyer at the end of the day. He may volunteer, I may reject him, you know. I may not, I may not have to. Because he may be seen infiltrating into my group of house buyers. You get it? Now, back to loan. Now, we did say that there are a lot of house buyers who actually may not have the income, but they have got pasamalam business. They also have got side income by you know, having this uh, direct sales, MA direct sales. They may also be having nasilama stalls, all that. They are good business, they are bad times, all that. What if they are also engaging uh, grab car drivers? You must take that into consideration when you evaluate a loan. So bank is not so cruel after all. They actually do. But they are, like I say, when I started the, the, the talk, they are actually doing you a favor by telling you that you are not eligible for so much, but you are eligible of course, for that little. That's about it. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Mr. Chan. So um, maybe from another perspective, maybe would you maybe share some insights on if let's say risks were reduced by uh, the uh, for for example, I'm poor or I'm not. Uh, I do not have sufficient um, salary to qualify for certain amount of loan. If that risk is being reduced, how would that have helped? And would uh, I understand that there is this uh, shared ownership housing scheme that we wanted to do in Penang, but it didn't work. Uh, probably, why would you be able to share more on this this uh, perspective? Yes. Uh, very good afternoon, thank you. I think when we talk about loans uh, and uh, when uh, Mr. Chang said it's, uh, the banks are doing you a favour when they reject your loan because you're not eligible, the point here where the state government is concerned and we are very concerned about the high loan rejection rate is not that person who wants to buy a house that is 500,000. It is for that person who wants to buy a house that is 42,000. And that person cannot get a loan for 42000 Now that is very unfair to us as a government because we have to ensure that the lower income group are housed. And we are working very hard to ensure there is adequate stock of affordable housing. Various ranges. Generation 1 in Penang, the top highest price affordable house was 400000 on the island. Generation 2, we've reduced it to 300000 just recently. So we've got various types. CM has uh, alluded to low cost, low medium cost. Low cost is 42,000. Low medium cost is 72,000. Then we've got several other products ranging from 150, 200, 250, 300 now. Now, if a person cannot get a loan for 42,000, when the bank rejects them, now, that becomes a big problem. He is not asking for a 500,000 loan. He is only asking for probably 38,000 because he has to come up with the first 10%, 4,000. And he can't even get 38%, 38,000. Don't worry, the banks, of course, they, they view this applicant as a risk category. Put, the, put this applicant in a risk category. Because one of the ways to be eligible for low cost, low medium cost, we are very strict on the eligibility criteria. Banks got their eligibility, housing department also got their eligibility. In order to be eligible to buy 42, you cannot earn more than $2,500 a month. In order to, earn, to buy 725, you cannot earn more than $3,500 a month. And, the, and it goes on to 150s, 200s, 250s, it's about 6, 8, 10, 12. So there's a price gap. If you earn more than that, you cannot, you're not eligible to buy that. So their argument is, you only earn $2,500, and just now CM has said, uh, household debt is at 86%. It reduced from 89 to 87 <laughs> 89%, 86 not, not much difference, very high. So that's the reason why they are rejecting. But our counter-argument is this. The banks should not have a one-fit-all uh, one size fit all policy. I've always said, you know, when a person takes a bus because he can't, he doesn't even have a motorbike. That's why his income is only 2005. He takes a bus and he goes to the bank and he asks for a loan. And a guy who owns that Bentley or Rolls Royce goes to the bank with his Bentley or Rolls Royce, asks for a loan. Both have to be subject to the same policy by the bank. Now, that is not right. 
So we are arguing and asking Bank Negara, and we have already engaged with the first state in Malaysia to engage with Bank Negara. They have come, they have explained their side of the view, uh, which is, of course, they are worried about the risk and the factor. So we are trying to implement some measures to reduce the gap. That means at the moment we have numbers that suggest for first time home buyers, and we are concerned about that first time home buyers, it's affordable housing. The rejection rate is as high as 70%. Of course, the associations of banks, Malaysia, has responded by saying 20%, but this state government does not agree. So does data. We have our numbers. In fact, our, I have one project in Batu Kawan, our first affordable housing project, uh, which is going to be completed physically at the end of this year. That project, the first phase in Batu Kawan, Bandar Kasia, has got 520 units. And out of the 520 units, to, to date, only 44% have been sold, which is around 200 uh, plus, just under 200 plus. Despite the housing se section, my office, because this, uh, this pipe, these projects, you, you have to get the name list from the housing department. So I, I will vet the applicant to see that he's not some millionaire who wants to get an affordable housing. Not allowed. It is for those people who, are, who earn a certain amount and below. The, the lower income do you know for the 520 units, I've actually, in the last two years, given PDC, because PDC is managing that property, 1,000 over names. The demand is there, but only 200 people got it. What does that show? 80% loan rejection rate. That is just my state government project. So what I'm trying to say is, it might, okay, just now uh, Chang said, if you don't service your loan, what would the bank do? Foreclosure. Now, so the, the banks are saying, listen, there's a high possibility that this low-income earner is not going to be able to service his loan and uh, we have to foreclose. So my argument is very simple. Although he is a very he is a low-income earner, that's the reason why he's eligible to the low-income, low low-cost house. You must understand that in Penang, the day you sign that agreement for $42,000, actually your property is worth $100,000. Do you know the construction cost of actually a low cost or low medium cost, which is around 650 square feet <coughs> apartment, is around 150,000 actual construction cost today. The market, if today I sign, most likely I think it is worth, at least I say conservatively, 100,000. So the bank should understand the security is actually in the property. Don't be so harsh on this group. Don't look at their, oh, they're only 2,500, he's got credit card, he has to pay his motorcycle loan, how is he going to service the loan? No. If at all, the pinch to them will be yes, there will be many foreclosure cases. But the security is there. So that's why we are saying that you cannot treat the low income earner just like the millionaire on the street who wants to buy property and which, which is priced in the millions. That is why we are engaging in the Ghana place here. We have come up with several measures now whereby they have their officers uh, communicating with the housing department office, my, my, my officers, to see how we can, like I said, narrow the gap, reduce that, that uh, high uh, rejection rate. One is now we require uh, all applicants to submit their secrets as well, so that we can actually ascertain from the very word go whether he's going to have problems uh, getting the loan. And what we do is, if he is, we don't give, uh, we don't offer that person until we, we counsel that person to, to improve his credit worthy, worthiness. And we have seen some improvement uh, today. But of course, that's why I'm saying uh, to Bank Negara, like CM has said, we have got many, many ways that you can address this. You can have uh, progressive payments, uh, tiered payments. There are many, many ways in other jurisdictions it's already happening. So in Malaysia, it's about time Bank Negara Malaysia uh, come up with a policy to assist the low income earner and direct all commercial banks to adhere to that policy. That is my view. And of course, your other thing on uh, uh, SOS. SOS stands for Shared Ownership Scheme. Now this, this scheme, uh, what SOS in, is intended for is this. It is in practice in other jurisdictions, uh, most notably in London, uh, in UK. And uh, we, we, we modeled the SOS that we, were, we, we did implement begin, at the beginning on UK. What happens is, let's say the property is $100,000. SOS, basically, we are shared owners. The state will, will share the property with the buyer. I will, I will give you 
I will give you 30%, 30,000. You, you come up with 70,000. Then you service 70,000 to your bank, but you also service 30,000 to us. And once you, you have completed that 30,000, then the entire property will, will uh, become yours. That was the idea. But we have a problem here because, like CM said, even the 70,000, they can't get loan. Even after we, we service the, the 30,000, number one. And number two, in the terms of, in the context of our law in Malaysia, Schedule G H uh, of the Act, which Mr. Chang has adverted to just now, we that basically Schedule G and H is the standard format sale and purchase agreement. That means all S and P in Malaysia must follow that. You cannot deviate from that. It will be criminal if you do so. Now the problem with SOS cannot be implemented in Malaysia in Penang, in Penang, in Penang, because of G and H. It didn't allow us unless there's going to be an amendment. That, that only can be done at the federal level. So that's why we scrapped that. But in Penang, the other way to look at it, uh, which I think just now CM has mentioned, uh, rent to buy. And I think Mr. Chang also rent to buy. Because there are some people who can't even afford at 42,000, they can't even come up with 4,000. I am taking care of those people. Mr. Chang is not even taking care of those people. I <laughs> So, but my job is uh, quite good. Uh, but you see, they, they cannot get the four, they can't even get the four thousand. They can't even get the four thousand. So that is why there is this other scheme. Of course, we, there are many types of schemes. SOS was one of them, but it could not happen because of legal problems. The next thing is, of course, uh, uh, what you call this rent to buy, which I think is a good policy, but it is something that you really need big money. And the state government, unfortunately, we are not federal government. We don't have that much of funds. So we can do very limited. We have started in Penang. We have got two projects, by the way, Mr. Chan. In uh, SPS, response very good. Response very good. So hopefully, uh, in fact, I just wanted to inform you that uh, recently CM has given the housing department some budget. Uh, I will announce shortly how much, but I can say in principle that the budget has been given for me to look into more uh, ways to implement, buy and sell for this category really hardcore poor uh, 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 candidates. Thank you. So you have something to say uh, about it? Yeah, you are young board, I, I don't want to defend my position. <laughs> <laughs> but I now understand better. I now understand better with the explanation that low cost is 42,000, but collateral worth 120,000. Okay? Now I've got a proposal uh, you know, about this rent to own rent to own, uh, I, the proposal is that perhaps uh, Penang State Government incorporate an SPV, Special Purpose Vehicle, to undertake this road rent to own. Now this SPV will acquire all the suitable unsold stock of housing developers, meaning low cost, uh, meaning low cost all that. And this, this unsold stock of developers, to me some of it are overhung property, cannot sell one, you know, okay? Now it should be acquired at a discount from the original sale price. Assuming his sales price is 42,000, go for a discount because after all, his unit can't sell anyway. So then you have got a property developers then give you a discount and say 35,000. From 42, become 35. And your collateral is worth 120,000 or 150,000 because that's the value worth that the developer had put in. Then discuss with the consortium and bank. Provide funding for SPV to acquire this unsold stock. Interest rate, again, lower in the market because these are already really low cost, low cost one and to comfort this uh, this bank consortium maybe uh, the Penang State Government could give a guarantee over to them perhaps consider this area I did email across over to Lim Kuan on this area then you can mop up all these low cost flats all that for the sake of their buyers meaning run to them first okay so you, you can decide to rent at maybe $350 but set aside part of it say about $100 for the actual installment later. So half rental, half bid, macam chagaran or part payment towards purchase. Consider that area. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, actually, Mr. Chang, uh, this time I ended by saying uh, recently there's a budget that has been given to the housing department, my office. Uh, technically, my office is that SPV, as you have suggested. And technically, I, I don't know whether you have any inside information, but more or less, more or less what you have said is what we are going to do. But I will announce it at the right time. Thank you very much. Wow. That is just the first question, everyone. Okay, so basically...
but please correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Chang. Is it true that uh, low cost, high risk uh, <coughs> mortgage loaners actually have to serve a higher interest rate than the normal risk mortgage loan? Not that they are special. They are special privileged group. Use the state government negotiate with them. It must be lower. After all, developer has sacrificed to price at a 42. Similarly, bank or anybody else escalating down should also make their certification. All right, thank you very much. That's one, one point to clarify. So, no doubt there's a lot of interest actually in new development. And just now, Mr. Chang has also mentioned that, you know, there's so much risk to take for a new development and to buy and own a new development. But there's this speculation uh, or maybe stigmatization that the new one is always going to be better. But I think, uh, Mr. Chan, would you be able to share some point of view from the house buyer perspective, like why people prefer new development, which is why developers continuously build new houses? Please. Why house buyers prefer new development? Those house buyers are not too intelligent, man. They want to buy a pie in the sky. Come on, I did emphasize over to you. Don't buy something that is not there. Buy something that is already there. I tell you why. Now, when you buy a property that is not there, you run the risk of abandonment. Sakit lewa terpengkalai. You run the risk of EOT. That is the controversial issue now in the market. You run the risk of buy property not perfect defects. Presently, we got a lot of cases that are launching at the Ministry of Housing. Vacant possession given to house buyer, tampa, check, tampa electricity and water. How do you expect to stay in a house when there's no electricity and water? And mind you, you know what the developer says? The, the, the buyer must apply electricity and water separately. But isn't that part of a developer's job to apply for electricity and water? That is part of the bargain. Right? When you buy a house, everything must be connected. Right. Even electricity, you put about that ada api. You turn out the tap ada air. That's more meaningful. It cannot otherwise, uh, you know, give you vacant possession without big, uh, uh, without electricity water. Now again, when you buy one property that is not, uh, you know, uh, not completed, you got to be alerted of the developer's track record. You got to be the, the alerted of the developer's financial means to complete the project. Why run such risk? I might as well buy a property from a sub market, a secondary market, when the project has been completed. I know where my amenities are. I, I know where the uh, transportation are and the pl place of worship. I know where the supermarket is. Wouldn't that be an easier undertaking than take the risk of two, 24 months, 36 months of EOT? and pray to God that nothing happens. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So, uh, sale demarcation, this is for sub-sale property and not the new development. So, then, this question, why are developers continuously but, uh, building new houses? So, um, Wabi Jackdip, I know that there is this very impose for property flipping as I mentioned uh, by CM just now. So do you think that this has actually helped to curb speculation and would that eventually slow down the pace of new development? Or do you think that the demand is still there in the market for new development has the developer continuously <coughs> built new ones? Uh, in Penang, what is happening is uh, we are concentrating on affordable housing, as you know. The Penang State Government, we have 14 projects in our five districts that will see various types of affordable housing being delivered to the stock, the market. Uh, beginning, like I said, end of this year, physically completed in Patukawan. So you'll see around 26,551 units that will be delivered. This is a Penang State Government project, 14 of them at this point in time. We are still, we are still planning uh, more. Uh, when you talk about developers, uh, we are also developers uh, in that sense. But the private sector is also helping us uh, because, as you know, we are a Pakatan state. So the federal government is not assisting us in any way. There, there are federally, uh, uh, 
federal affordable housing projects, as you all know, Prima. But do you know till today, Prima, Prima began by law in 2012. Until today, we are 2017, mid-year now. Not even one unit in Prima has been built in Penang. And we pay taxes. So, I mean, that's one thing, of course, I'm very, uh, very uh, upset and disappointed with uh, how that the federal government has uh, uh, treated Penang, where Prima is concerned. But to be fair, uh, they have recently put in applications of about five, three have been approved, but still no commencement of work. Approving a, a plan is one thing, but whether they build is another thing. So what do we do? The Penang State Government, in order to ensure there is adequate stock, we need to have support from the private sector. Now in 2014, September 2014, I came up with a policy which we are the first state in Malaysia, uh, which is the 100% affordable housing uh, policy for private sector. That means currently a private developer, he will build uh, his high-end properties and there's only a compliance quota whereby he has to build 30% low cost, low medium cost, depending on which area. That is the only compliance quota. So that, and that, that is where we get our uh, stock for those low income earners. In generation one affordable housing, there was one policy that required, apart from the 30%, 25% to be affordable housing, which was that time 200 to 500,000. Generation two, uh, we reduced it to 400,000. And the latest one was my policy in 2014, whereby they do they cannot build any high end in a particular block. They come and apply to us. All their block units are uh, what you call 100% affordable. That means maximum 300,000 depending on the area. 300,000 is the limit. So what happens is we incentivize, we give them incentives to build. Otherwise, they, it's just not viable. It, they, they can't do it. And I am very pleased to announce that as a result of that policy, until today, we have got some 18,000 units already approved to be built by the private sector under that 100%. So we are looking at about 44,000 units that will come in the next 10 to 15 years in Penang. Uh, of course, uh, just now your question is uh, uh, why? Yeah, the speculation, the speculation. Uh, no, you are talking first about it. Or just uh, responding to Mr. Chuck and uh, why are there so many projects out there? Uh, this, in relation to speculation, uh, as CM said just now, when, when uh, he announced in 2014 it was a housing budget, uh, we realized that in, since 2008 to 2014, there was a spiraling effect on price, house prices in Penang especially. Actually, in the four urban uh, cities in Malaysia, Johor Bahru, uh, Selangor, Wilayah, Sutuan and Penang, uh, ours went up the most. Uh, as of end 2014, so we saw we saw we saw that something very uh, uh, I would say negative was going to happen if we did not intervene. So the state had to intervene, and we, we came up with a two prong uh, approach. One is the cooling measures, which uh, is the levy uh, in relation to uh, purchases by foreigners, which is uh, they, they cannot uh, they, they must be an approval fee of two percent. Uh, and in relation to the, the flipper, that means the speculator, that is the most uh, evil person of all. Uh, we have imposed within three years. If you no, the, the foreigners was three percent uh, of the on top of the transaction price for the flipper, the speculator. If you buy today and within three years you sell, you are considered a speculator, and you have to pay on top of whatever transaction price two percent to the state. That is what we have been trying to do. Of course, we are. We have seen, uh, in relation to uh, your question uh, just now, whether there is any. Uh, what is the what is the impact of our measures? Okay, before I come to that, the first problem was that the cooling measures, several uh, approval fees or levies, if you want to uh, want to call it that, uh, that word. And Penang is not a levy. It's Penang is calling it uh, what you call approval fee. Uh, we also felt the best way control price was to have price control. That's why we have our affordable housing uh, price caps. And for your information, I'm very pleased to announce that uh, NAPIC, NAPIC is this agency that gives you all the statistics and data on residential uh, property transactions and so forth. Last year, Mr. Chuck, in Penang, uh, we managed to see that nearly 80% of all uh, residential transactions were in relation to properties 500,000 and below. 
that is nearly 80%. So that means the market has stabilized. You can, no, no developer wants to build only 20% again, uh, market share, no. So the market stabilized in terms of residential transaction, 80% was 500 and below. Of course, 500 and below is not even our range. Our range is taking 300 and below. But for me, in Penang, because it was hovering around 7 800,000 in 2014, and it came down now to around 500, because 80%. And this year, so far, there's uh, statistics that have uh, come out that, that suggests that the median uh, uh, price, uh, the median price uh, nationally, uh, because nationally you've got cooling measures also, like what Mr. Chang said, RPGT, stamp duties, etc. That is the national ones. But in Penang, we've got additional. So nationally, there was a reduction in residential property prices of 0.4%. That means generally in the whole of Malaysia. But out of all the states, we were the highest uh, reduction, 3.2% on all, all types of property. So I think uh, I'm very pleased to say, because in any jurisdiction, any country, like Singapore, Hong Kong, they also are facing this property crisis because the, the, the seriously unaffordable pro pro uh, properties there. They also have their cooling measures, but they, their measures only work about three years to four years after it is implemented. So Penang, actually, we are now uh, year four. Uh, we, are, we, are, we are actually year four now. So that's why I'm seeing uh, these statistics, which I believe is a, as a result of our, our intervention by those measures. Thank you. Okay, so, all right. Sure, I'd I, I like to take the opportunity to uh, let you all know, reiterate that what Jagdeep Singh, uh, you know, our mem member of parliament said, uh, is correct. Uh, a lot of great effort has been put in. I've been searching the website. I've been keeping an eye on, I've been keeping an eye on Penang. Don't worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> Making sure that everybody toes the line. Uh, but then, fantastic job. Let's give a round of applause to YP. At my federal level, uh, I'm also you know, uh, making sure that developers don't continue to cheat you in a uh, not built property. We're talking about Schedule G and HLM. Now, the law has just been changed again. Effective 15 August 2014. All SMP agreement must include the approved plans. No more sketch plan, you know. No more such thing as developer sketch plan, not according to dimension. No more plans like, for instance, you know, uh, he show you the location, future development, a layout to say next door is future development. No more like that, you know. It is now compulsory, effective first, 15 August 2014, that all developers licensed by Ministry of Housing must have schedules at the back of the SMB with the PBT approved plan, meaning the plan, the big one, the blueprint. Signed by developer, signed by local council, chop and sign the Lulu scan. That is according to dimension. Plan that has laid out plan that the developer wants to build. This is to facilitate tribunal. Just in case of any dispute whatsoever, it can be re referred over tribunal. Similarly, you are then guided by the plan. No more sketch plan because a lot of developers do not wish to cooperate with you by giving you the actual plan. But I know the agreement is going to be so thick. One agreement can be sorted because there are so many plans in there and that big plan is this huge. But to compromise it, we agreed to accept CD. Give us a CD attached to the SMP. That's good enough. So be alerted, effective 15 August 2014. Make sure all your SMP agreement has got those plans. Read my article called Full Disclosure by Developer. I penned it in 26 June 2014. Please learn from those articles. Thank you. Okay. Take note, take note. Remember to check the CD when you receive it. Otherwise, just flip to the end and look for the plan. All right. Let's continue with our next question. So, um, Dr. Lim, from an economic perspective, would you be able to share a little bit more on this um, property market, like how speculation has driven up the price, but with certain control, it actually brings down the price further? Uh, like uh, what Rabbi Jagdeep just mentioned just now, and how has GST impacted on the transaction of all properties in Penang? For example, if I have a company set up and I purchase a property uh, as an asset for the company, can I actually uh, claim it back somehow uh, through the GST yet thing? How, how does it work? It's a rather long question. I think uh, split up to two. I think the first thing about the level of speculation, 
Uh, YB has highlighted very correctly that since 2008, there's been a spike, well, it's a steep rise in property prices in, in Penang. And uh, if, you, if you know the global economic situation, the after the financial crisis, globally all central banks have slashed interest rates. So essentially, cost of funding, cost of money, cost of interest rates, cost of loan is very low. So there's a flood of money coming in from everywhere, it's sloshing around, flying around in, in the global financial system. So where it lands all depends on, to some extent, the desirability of the place. So property is location, location, to location, and Penang is obviously a very attractive location. So there is a, a flood of money coming into this part of, 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 of Malaysia, and speculation is to some extent driven by greed and expectation of higher increase. So what you want is you want to buy it, you want to buy it today and then you sell it to the next person in X period of time later. So when some levies and some approval fees are come, come into the play, come into place, then expectation of continuous rise is going to fall. So there is not going to be the expectation that the price will continue to increase and as a result, prices moderate. So the thing is, is, is that when in the last few months, what has changed is globally, there's a lot of inflation expectation. It is not only happening in Penang, happening in Malaysia. What we feel in our pocket, what we feel in our spending, is not. We know inflation is increasing. So what? has happened is that property then becomes a very good inflation hedge. If the, if the value of the low cost, medium low cost property is worth significantly more than the building cost of it, the replacement cost of it, then naturally this would be in, in effect a very good inflation hedge. Because if you were to tear it down and rebuild, rebuild it, it would cost three, four times more than what it would be. And then that leads to the question of, of GST. The imposition of 6% GST naturally flows into the uh, uh, building material cost. But one has to be careful that residential property, there is no GST in place on it. So whether a, com whether a company would be able to uh, buy, buy a property and then uh, and claim the GST part of it, the GST rules itself is very fluid and changes all the time. And I'm glad that the, uh, the person who's more qualified is sitting on the second row, who is the uh, KPMG partner. So I shall not comment on this at this time. He's screaming now because I asked him a question and he told me that uh, it's very complicated. So best that I, not, I shall not comment on it. But what is also happening globally is banks themselves are under pressure because if the interest rate is low, the interest rate margin is actually very low as well. So they, in some extent, to some extent, has the incentive to really be generating lots of loan. If you can, I'll give you more loan because in the past 10 years ago, it could be for every one million, I can make 3% margin, 4% margin. But now it could be that the margin is only 1 or 2% because the interest rates has come down so much. So to get the same amount of profit, banks would really want to be pushing a lot of loan. So that's one aspect of it. The other aspect in terms of of new creative ideas that they are coming up. We know that we have Uber, we know that we have Grab, we know that we have Airbnb, but in, in the financing and banking world, there is also these things called peer-to-peer -peer lending. So perhaps in a, in a something that the state could be considering is some sort of mechanism that matches the providers of capital to the users of capital. So these things, Bank of Grab has already pulled out white paper in terms of peer-to-peer, -peer, how these things can be done and how different types of app can be developed to try to match the buyer of capital with the seller of capital. And we already seen such things happening in America. We have different types of applications that will actually enable uh, buyers and sellers of money to be matched together. So bypass this in some sense bypassing the, the, the need for bank. Um, separately, to touch on and to add on to, to what Mr. Chang has pointed as, as, Mr. Chang has, as well as YB has highlighted is the use of SPV and the need for REITs. Uh, Real Estate Investment Trust is 
It is liked by lots of people because it offers a secure stream of income. And it is perhaps something that the state could be considering in packaging something into, uh, for, for future uh, financing purposes. All right, thank you. So now I learned a new thing, peer-to-peer -peer lending. Uh, finally, from a, a moderated session, uh, from this moderated session is, I would like to touch on rental property. But we, uh, you mentioned a little bit more, uh, I mean, you mentioned just now, like uh, rent-to-buy schemes and things like that. How are the public renting, rental housing doing in Penang? And what are the number one challenge that you find in managing this public rented housing? What's the most difficult thing for your department to do? Uh, public renting uh, is called uh, PPR. In Penang, we have four schemes, four PPR schemes. In fact, I was just there this morning uh, launching the GRPB program at this hour. Uh, this is not including the two rent buys uh, in uh, SPS. Now, our challenge where rental is concerned, that's not I, I spoke to you about the low income earner, earning 2,005 or 3,005 and below, who's eligible to low, low cost or low medium cost. But there are those, like I said, who can't even come up with the 4K and can't even afford the 42. So, what, how do we help them? We have to look at rent to buy or rent public rentals. So the public rentals are our PPR. But uh, the one big challenge, uh, challenge, challenge, challenge yeah. to the state. Yeah. Okay, the challenge to the state is this. Uh, we find the even rentals, by the way the rental is one hundred dollars, that is for the rent. And then you have to pay an additional twenty four ringgit for maintenance. So it's a one two four per month. That's the general uh, range for our PPRs Mr. Chan Kuminang. So even the one two four, we find it very difficult to collect. Even the one two four, there are people out there who can't afford to pay. Do you know that? That is the difficulty of government. So we have to address that kind of category of people. And do you know for information that out of all our public housing schemes, where maintenance and rental, that is not just the, the rentals. I'm talking also about the, we have fifty schemes. Uh, which the Penang State Housing Department oversees, apart from the four PPRs and the two rent to buys, our total arrears or rather outstanding rentals plus the maintenance charges as of April this year is 17.4 million. You know, that is our difficulty. And uh, of course, this morning at this hour, I, I urge the residents, you know, you must. You must understand the purpose of uh, the maintenance charges being paid. Even if you pay, and I collect 100%, it means if, if it's ideal, uh, ideal, everybody pays, the state will still have to come up with money to maintain your building. Because that 24 ringgit is the old rate. And even 24 ringgit, they are still defaulting. So that is our biggest challenge. And so I urge them, you know, it's only for your own good that you do that. And we hope that uh, there will be some awareness and education on uh, which is which which is what we are continuously doing and uh, of course I, I am told that although it is 17.6 there is a slight reduction in the increase there will always be areas every year but rather than the areas like let's say it's a million this year going up to 1.5 next year it, it, it is reducing it comes out to let's say 800 so you know we are seeing some form of uh, awareness uh, part of uh, these residents. I think that, that is what I have to say this issue. So that is like uh, areas in not paying maintenance and the failure to collect that which make the job of the state government to maintain public housing even more difficult. Alright, so Mr. Chen, could you maybe share some also some insight if there's any regulation in place for rental property Malaysia. So in case of default, yeah. So in case of defaults like this, will that act or, or, or regulation can be put in place but knowing that they are so poor and they couldn't afford, what else can we do? <laughs> Strictly by the book, I'll kick them out. <laughs> but we cannot do that politically. I mean, that's not fair. We cannot throw the poor fellows on the street. We've got to find way, that's where YB and Jagdeep will come up with those, uh, you know, how to sort out those areas. But legally speaking, 
if they don't pay, I will kick them out, just like any tenancy whatsoever. You don't pay my rental, you get out. Simple as that. Okay? You don't pay maintenance, you follow the strata management right, go to the tribunal. Then he will be he will be penalized at the tribunal. If you do not pay rental, there's another group of house buyers who is entitled to their low cost. Thus, you must leave the premises so that the new owner can come in who may be a better paymaster. But those legally, it can be done. But then, uh, I, I think uh, your state government has got a heart. <laughs> it is very important, you know, you're going to do something about this area because we really cannot kick them out in the streets. Nobody wants to be born poor. That's about it, you tell yourself. Nobody wants to be born poor. There are circumstances whereby they are poor and uh, you know, rich people cannot look down at them at all because there are issues like those. Some of them cannot find a job, just, just left prison. They can't find a job, what can we do? S certain circumstances, that area, moral, morals, I leave it over to the state government. <laughs> Legally, I can speak about that area. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Before I became ex-co, I was also a lawyer. <laughs> yeah, legally, of course, it's, it's all stated in the, in the tenancy agreement. If you default, you can terminate and take action. But uh, for public housing, I mean, private, that is a separate issue. For public housing, of course, there are some genuine cases where they really cannot afford to pay. And what we do is we, we have a, a committee that, that oversees cases on a case-by-case -case basis and we allow many mechanisms, we have many mechanisms as to how to assist them and get them to pay. If not all, whatever, is outstanding, but they pay installments and that is really working. That is why I've seen a reduction in the last two, three years in the increase. So that is really working, that is how we are going. But on the other hand, do you know there are people who abuse public housing? Do you know uh, the, the, the tenants in PPR they are not supposed to, like, like the 42 purchaser was 2-5 cap, right? For a renter, it is a 1-5 cap in Penang. But some PPRs, you can see Mercedes inside park. <laughs> they got Astro. No, yeah, and then they got Astro. Very good point, I'm coming to that. You always read my mind. <laughs> and they got Astro. They can pay their Astro, but they cannot pay their rent and maintenance charge. So you know what we have done? We own the building. So we immediately take the Astro out. <laughs> Straight away they came and paid the, the rent. <laughs> These are the ways we try to control. The ones who are abusing, but there are some, if we, when we survey, we, we monitor, the real abusers, we do take action, Mr. Chan. But we, as far as we are concerned, I have uh, stated to housing, we try to assist those real genuine poor families. Alright, thank you very much. And my final question to Dr. Lim. So, rental property market is somehow very um, difficult to gauge. Just like maybe it's not even registered, who is regulating it, like any uh, regulators that's overseeing the rental market. I doubt there is any. So, from economic perspective, how do you actually estimate this? How big is the rental property market in, in Penang, for example? Uh, how do you actually estimate the rental market? Uh, I guess you have to do a, a survey of the estate agents, look at what has been listed on the main website. Uh, there are uh, different types of apps. Uh, you have Airbnb, so that's the way, there are ways that you can strip off all the data from all these websites and then you do an analysis of how large is the rental market. Obviously, there will be a lot of duplications in, in it because someone would have asked multiple agents to, to find the rental uh, the, the pen for one particular one. And uh, how large it is, sometimes you, you go on the street and then you look at, in the evening, you look at one particular unit, one the block of units, you can see how many lights are there. And then you can then gauge how many are actually people living in there and how many are actually not living in there. But it comes back to one point, which is that what is the property serving? Is it serving as a consumption that you use it for your own yourself? Or is it using as an inflation page? You just want to buy something so that in 10 years time you can still sell it and then you would think that you will not lose money out of it? Or it's purely for speculation. So so and and the, the sourcing and the and the categorization 
categorization of these properties then becomes more difficult. We, when we look at it, which, what, which property has a light on is probably for consumption purposes. But it doesn't gauge whether it's been used for itself or it's been rented out. So it is a, to some extent, an impossible task to be gauging how large is, is the rental market because there are just so many things that are moving, uh, in fact, are moving. One can only make a calculated guess at the end of the day. All right, thank you. Uh, perhaps based on the amount of uh, vehicles in, in the unit or traffic in the, in the roads, uh, population, household, all these things to gauge the, uh, the, the number. All right, so technically speaking, we can actually look at like, house buyers and, and things like that, but not like landowners, uh, rented property, um, maybe there may be some violation to it, and how, how do you protect it? Uh, for some, for some uh, places, which actually to some extent, I think the, uh, uh, the tenancy agreement is a legal document, so a legal document needs to be stamped in the uh, stamp office. So as such, if one really wants to do a uh, evaluation of how, what's the rental value, what's the, the, the rental amount, and, which you etc etc it is possible but whether the system in the stamp office is capable of capturing all this is a separate issue all right thank you very much so i know we have taken a long time doing this panel discussion and i hope that it's fruitful for all of you <laughs> so thank you very much and thank you everyone for staying 25 minutes no 30 minutes past our expected uh, end time so thank you very much